Why is he confusing us with pretty words that are empty of any import or context or spirituality? What is going on here? This is a disaster. That's exactly what's being proposed. And it's all tied in to the concept of citadelity. This is really not about the Bidens. This is about the intelligence agencies that have gone completely rogue. The Synod is over and we are back from Rome. We had an incredible Rome Life Forum, which we're going to discuss with you. But there's so much going on right now with the United States having betrayed Christ again, at least in Ohio, with this unbelievable vote, putting abortion right into the Constitution. It's stunning. It makes a lot of people worry about the future of the United States in a, in a very real way because the blood of these children cries out to heaven for vengeance. Nevertheless, we have all sorts of things going on. We have Bill Gates talking about digital ID for newborns in Kenya. And we have Jack Maxey here to discuss with us that there were 40 confidential informants about Biden's criminal activity being discussed in the Congress now as well. All that and much more on this episode of Faith and Reason. Stay tuned. Hey friends, so to celebrate the momentous overturning of Roe v. Wade, we at LifeSite have minted just under 10,000 of these brand new limited edition pro-life silver rounds. Each round is stamped on the back with an image of the Supreme Court of the United States featuring the date that the High Court delivered this historic victory. And on the front of our pure silver rounds, there's the LifeSite logo surrounded by a brilliant sunburst and draped with olive branches to commemorate LifeSite's 25 years anniversary of serving the pro-life and pro-family community. I want you to know too that if you go to St. Joseph's Partners through the LifeSite link, you will be able to fulfill there all of your silver and gold needs in this perilous time. May God bless you. Jack, Liz, and Father Murray, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Great to see you. So good to be here with you always. Father, if you could start us off with a prayer, please. Certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, so Rome Life Forum uh, just ended. We got back, and praise God, the, the synod is over. Um, just to let everyone know what actually happened, Cardinal Muller was there speaking. Bishop Joseph Strickland was there, and it was a strategy session for leaders on life, faith, family, and freedom from around the world. Rome Life Forum has been going on since 2014. It's a yearly meeting in Rome, and it's acted as a consistent show of resistance against the agenda coming from Pope Francis. And through the Synod on Synodality, that agenda has become more clear because even though people say, oh, there wasn't much done, well, yes, there was. Remember the outset of the Synod where the even last year selections were made for the Synod. Who did Pope Francis select but all the most heretical cardinals, especially on the area of same-sex blessings? And indeed, at the beginning of the Synod, if you remember, we talked about on this very program, how it was going to be launched with a lecture or a reflection by none other than Timothy Radcliffe, a radical LGBT promoting priest. And then when they went into it, sure, it was what would they discuss? Synodality, synodality, synodality. But over top of the Synod, Pope Francis himself had his own little uber synod where starting off right before it started with the answers to the dubia where he opened the door to same-sex blessings and then during the synod he talked with Whoopi Goldberg with um, <laughs> the rainbow Catholic, I forget what their name is, but the, the group, heads of all the groups that do LGBT pushes in the church. And that was all during the synod. It was 
absolutely unbelievable. So he had his own little uber synod going on. And that's what we dealt with. Liz was there and there were leaders from all over the world. It was absolutely incredible. Liz, thank you so much for your contributions there, which were stellar. And I encourage everyone to go to lifesitenews.com, go to our video page, and you'll be able to watch the presentations as we're now rolling them out. That press conference uh, that we did to react to the synod was just stunning. And Liz, you were a total firecracker. I have to give you the good news and the bad news. The great news is the streets of Rome are full of young priests and cassocks. And it's almost like it's the um, public protest of Pope Francis, who has been, you know, denigrating priests and cassocks as saying they're cleric, clericalism. Um, the bad news is, is that I can attest to the St. Peter's Dome is black, turning black. I guess we can all say the future is bright. Um, one thing I want, Peter, you know, John Henry, you know, the Rome Life Forum, what a great team you have. Um, there were people from 23 countries. Um, the Africans, actually, you know, took the spot, spotlight with their brave witness, leading the charge both um, at home in Africa, at the Synod, and at our Rome Life Forum. Um, in fact, I think one of the most famous comments from an African bishop is that um, the LGBT gay marriage is really about witchcraft. Um, that's what we call it in Africa. Um, the Africans are really um, going to continue um, to push back. We understand that they push back in the Synod um, quite a bit. And I learned a great Italian word um, when we were talking about the Synod documents and how obtuse and vague and ambiguous. An Italian came up to me and said, we're all calling Pope Francis's Synod documents Super Cazola. Father, you may know that name, Super Cazola. It's an Italian word that means not only word salad, but it's a, a word that has no meaning. And so that, you know, that's what I'm going to refer to the Synod documents going um, here forward. I just have to say it was amazing because there are all these organic, organic cells all around the world, cells of resistance. Be they, they processions in the rosary, be they pushing back on the LGBT agenda, um, pro-life. It's amazing all over the world. And that's what I took away, that um, people are not waiting for leadership. They're just moving forward. Um, frankly, the leadership provided by LifeSite News um, and John Henry, it gives them a platform to talk about these events. So it's Great from start to finish, and uh, we have our work cut out for us going forward. One of the stunning things was the Africans' presentation. At one point, Alice Muchiri, who's the head of pol Catholic politicians in, uh, in Kenya, and they have a majority there, by the way, um, she's describing how politicians, if the president calls or a bishop calls, they run to the bishop first because they know that if the bishops call and say, we're watching you, their political career is over. They are so concerned about the church because the church is still a moral voice there that the majority of people listen to. And it is absolutely stunning. I, it, when I, we got back and we saw what just happened in Ohio, this is unspeakable. And yet that could never, ever happen in Africa, because in Uganda and Kenya, at least, where we had our representatives from there, um, it's just stunning. It's like a different universe. But they need our help, too. Um, they need to know what's actually happening. The MP from uh, Uganda, who was there, Lucia Kello, she basically admitted, you know, she would tell people, oh, it's not that bad. There's not that much going on in Rome. There's a problem. And she said she had her eyes opened and she apologized to those who were raising concerns to her before and whom she dismissed, she said she was wrong. It's just stunning. Uh, they are so powerful. Their voices are so powerful. And um, it's, a, it's a blessing for the church. Africa will be able to stay to the truths of Christ, whereas the West seems to be losing it. And I think also, by the way, people should know, Americans, that the UN, um, that the NGOs, that the United States USAID are dangling um, in front of the Ugandan saying, unless you change your laws, 
um, and may become pro bowl funds. And in fact, they're withdrawing hundreds of millions of dollars. And yet the Ugandans are saying, you know, you can't buy us off. You know, we, we are a family nation and these are our values and you can't um, threaten us. Um, so take your money and leave. I mean, this is really impressive. Um, in in a time where the whole world is awash in these uh, abortion LGBT agendas. So um, a shout out. And I think we should all take a page from Uganda. One thing that's interesting, I think it was the Commerce Department put out a notice about a week and a half ago saying that they're warning co uh, companies about doing business inside Uganda because they could out of uh, employment laws here in the United States. Um, I think the really sad part of all this is that I don't think the discrimination was was that great uh, in Uganda before all of this. I think it was more like the United States of 40 years ago where don't ask, don't tell was the rule and, uh, you know, discretion was the better part of valor. I think what these African nations resent so much is the United States coming in there and imposing our uh, moral code upon them, a moral code that really isn't even complete, ever been uh, brought to a vote in the United States. Remember, gay marriage in California by 58%. And a year later, the Supreme Court decided, you know, this was a human right. But I, I think they resent our meddling. And I think you saw this in Niger, where they're flying... Uh, Russian flags. This wasn't so much because they love Russia. This was because they knew the optics in the current situation would uh, tell the world that they resent us. And and we're seeing this across the planet where the U.S. gets involved. I mean, a perfect example and a forgotten one. Remember the uh, Save Our Girls campaign that Hillary, that uh, Michelle Obama and everyone got involved and held up the little posters. Well, those girls were never saved because Nigeria wouldn't fold to the LGBTQ thing at the, at the time. And therefore, the Obama administration withheld the military assistance that would have been necessary to save those girls. Uh, it, to me, it's it's shocking. And, and while, uh, you know, we here in the West like to uh, espouse human rights and we get this, this is something that's just not culturally present in Africa. There's no intersex shaman amongst the Bantu people. It's it's literally not part of their heritage. There's no Alexander the Great of, of uh, Central Africa. So for them, uh, this is a very much like a natural law issue. And it's unfortunate that we do this because we need Africa. We need them to be in our sphere of influence. We have uh, China in there aggressively. Um, and, and I just, uh, we see this across the planet. I apologize for yapping so long, but it's, it's an issue that is really problematic for our foreign policy in general. One of the things that in addition to the synod has really revolutionized the church, uh, in, in a very horrific way has been a new motu proprio from Pope Francis. I think it's something that most people don't know about yet. Um, our Rome correspondent, Michael Haynes, jumped on it immediately. So we had an article out the day it was released. And it is a very startling document from Rome calling basically for a new theology. Theology is the study of God. And it's very clear that, you know, if you read Thomas Aquinas or you read all the old manuals in Catholicism, it's where we want to take the purity of Christ and convey it to the world. So therefore, we're not going to delve into Eastern mysticism to try and glean something out of there. No, Christ gave himself as revelation to his people and to transmit to the whole wide world. And so it's a very pure science. It's the science of God. And it's, it's something that the church is called to transmit. And yet, Pope Francis takes that very thing and revolutionizes it. Here are some of the quotes, and then Liz, I'm going to ask you for a few more details, but listen to this. He says, and this is from Francis, promoting theology in the future cannot be limited abs to abstractly reproposing formulas and schemes of the past. Um, 
Well, then what is he going to do with the creed, which we've been professing for the last 2,000 years, this formula from the past which expresses perfectly our faith? But it goes on and on and on. Listen to this. This is, Francis argued that theology would necessarily move away from a path of presenting and teaching truths and into, and I quote, into a culture of dialogue and encounter between different traditions and different knowledge, between different Christian denominations and different religions, openly confronting everyone, believers and non-believers alike. What are you talking about? For one thing, this sounds all hoity-toity, so I'm sure there's many, many intellectuals who'd be like, yes, this is so great because it sounds so wonderful. We can it's basically making our own theology, by the way, from our own observations and studying into, I mean, who wouldn't love to research into Buddhism and all sorts of Eastern mysticism and glean a gem of something or other that you can convert into a theology of your own making? This is a disaster, but it's exactly what's being proposed. And it's all tied in to the concept of synodality. Yeah, I mean, John Henry, the phrase that, you know, absolutely sent me reeling is when he called for a new theology should not always quote be corresponding to the christian face of god should not be co corresponding to the christian face of god i mean this is apostasy and heresy at the highest levels we owe our life our allegiance our eternal salvation to the christian face of god now look i want to challenge everybody to read this document, it'll be in our show notes. And I want you to read it with discerning eyes. Read it three times. I guarantee that you will realize that entire sentences are meaningless. Paragraphs are indecipherable. Look, they're fancy words, as John Henry said, but why is he ambiguous? Why is he confusing us with pretty words that are empty of any import or context or spirituality? What is going on here? He is using language like the Marxists have to obscure a radical agenda. And um, this is, to me, so insidious. We saw it in all the synodal documents, in the instrumentum laboris, um, in the final documents, but this is a mode proprio. And I really urge people, because you can just gloss over these nice sounding words, but you really have to examine that what is said is nothing and and in fact, he said, look, he, he said, in order to practice the new theological style, style, theologians would have to prioritize common ideas found among people, even though such ideas reject the Catholic concept of God. I mean, this is, you know, this is, remember, common good, um, common faith. Um, common goals, common destiny, common earth world. This is the theology, th theology of communism. This is, we are all the same. This is the deindustrialization of the world. Common sense now, according to Francis, trumps the transcendent face and word of God. Okay, got it, folks? Common sense is now the new theology of Francis. So um, we've got to really be on top of our game. I mean, present company included. When you read this stuff, because it's alluring, right? Propaganda is alluring. And you can get sucked into um, this linguistic style, which is supposed to, you know, in effect, propagandizes us. So that's my two cents. I mean, this document is an abomination. I urge theologians, I'm not a theologian, but I urge theologians to start picking it apart. Let's take a very, very simple way of looking at this. It said that we're going to get to a place where it won't correspond with the Christian face of God. The Christian face of God is the only true face of God. Everything else that's not the Christian face of God is another God, is a false God, and there are no such things as false gods except for devils. So 
to me, this seems like a demonic theology. Father, I'd love your take on it. Liz, I disagree with one thing that you said. And that's, and you were very kind to say it. I'm going to be unkind. <laughs> you said it was alluring. And it was and it was uh, 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 attractive. I find it disgusting. Excuse me. I read the I read the the the, uh, the document last night, and I found it disgusting. I found it first of all anti intellectual, anti intellectual. I mean, completely all over the place, all over the place. Uh, uh, you know, one step forward, two back. This this the same routine, and I saw it also as 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 he himself, his holiness himself, getting closer to, to schism. This is where he's going. This is his direction. If, and let me just say this. When you say to the Catholic world that you want your future priests to know less theology so that they can sit down and dialogue with people, there is something very wrong with you. There is something very wrong with you. Look. All of us, when we when we got out of theology and everything else, and, and they were put into situations, whether it be in parishes, what, whatever our first assignment was, it took us, I would say, and I speak for most priests, I believe, uh, maybe a year, maybe two years to get over ourselves, theologically. <laughs> to, I, all of the knowledge that you had with philosophy and theology, now you had to bring it down to real cases, real people, real situations, all right? Well, that takes a little bit of of, of uh, trans transitioning, transitioning, right? But you've always got your theology. You've always you already you always have it to fall back onto. You, let me put it this way: I said it to somebody else earlier today. You have it to lose it if you want to, but at least you have it. This way, you're coming in with nothing. You're coming in with nothing because you've heard fifteen opinions. That's your theology. This is outrageous. It's yeah, this is just outrageous. I, I, I mean, he's done a, a lot of of amazing things. Amazing, and I've used that in the pejorative sense of the word uh, things. But this, this to me, really, really took the cake. I, 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 I couldn't. As a matter of fact, honestly, I thought somebody had written this as a, as a hoax. I really did. When I when I first read it, I read it. I thought it was, I thought it was uh, somebody falsified it. It was a joke, a sick joke, or whatever. No. No, and then I found it on the Vatican web website. No, it's real. It's it's outrageous. It's outrageous. And I think, and Liz, I've got to congratulate you on one thing that you said that that really caused a smile on on, on my face. Anyway, you said the dome, Saint Peter's dome, is black. The future is bright. <laughs> In what other context would that make sense except today? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. It's it's great. It's a great commentary. But but this this whole thing of Less theology is the most incredible. I've never heard anything like this in my life. This is just absurd. Could you imagine saying that to rocket scientists? Could you imagine going into a medical school and saying, you know what you doctors, your future doctors need? You need to study less medicine. You know, just yeah. <laughs> less science. And, you know, and, and talk to a lot of people and, and see what diseases they have and what, what, you know, if they've come up with household cures. It's a bizarre, absolutely bizarre. Less science so you can talk to the witch doctors. That's basically what do you think? I've been reading more about this, the Mayan right in, in southern Mexico. This is insane. This is absolutely insane. We're going, you're, you're chopping off 500 years of Catholicism, of Christianity, and you're going back to, to breaking eggs on people's heads and, and reading entra entrails of, 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 of of pigeons and chickens, I, 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 this is this is absolutely bizarre. <laughs> I, I don't. Even, I'm at the point where I don't even really know how to respond anymore. And when I told you that I read the document, the document the other night, thinking that it was a hoax, I really did. I did. I couldn't believe this was serious. This is where we are. The whole thing, and and you know what? The comments that you made about the about the uh, about the the synod on synodality. What a, what a ridiculous name. Uh, it, it it is it is rigged. It's a hope. It is rigged. It's rigged. This is a, this is the circus people. The carnies used to say that uh, all of the games of the circuses were rigged. This was rigged. And you look at all of the people that were handpicked to 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 choose these to uh, hand chosen 
to be in these groups of discussion, it's it's rigged. It's completely rigged. You can't rig God. You can't you can't outrig God. You want to fool God? You're gonna you're gonna rig everything and you're going to fool God. Not gonna happen. It's not going to happen. And and this is what I've been telling. I get I get hundreds of emails every week. I really do from from everywhere around the world, and people are looking for hope. And I keep telling there is hope. It's just not following that. Just stand your ground. Learn more that you more more and more of your own theology of catechism, and 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 stand still. Hang on, just wait. But uh, th- this this is this is outrageous. I don't, I just don't I don't have another word for it. It's just outrageous. I'm sure we're going to be hearing much more of that in the coming days. It was just broken, of course, and and uh, in light of the end of the synod. So there's going to be much more on that. But I wanted to get to something else. Something stunning happened in Congress this week. We had Senator Grassley give us information about the Biden criminal activity. Apparently, they had 40 whistleblowers come forward. Jack, can you give us more details? Senator Grassley wrote a letter asking what happened to the investigations concerning 40 confidential informants that the FBI had with information concerning uh, potential criminal activity by Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, and his brother Jim. Uh, and and yes, there is multiple examples of criminal activity. But somehow all of these investigations were shut down. Now, what I found very interesting reading the document was that it was specifically shut down by uh, the Baltimore office, which is kind of a euphemism for the counterintelligence group, which is based up in Baltimore, uh, right next to NSA. Uh, It is the group from which Peter Strzok was the number two. Peter Strzok was the guy who testified against Donald Trump and had the affair with the female uh, long-faced lawyer uh, from the FBI and said that we're going to make sure that Trump doesn't get reelected. That was his group. It was also a FBI agent from the counterintelligence group in Baltimore uh, or associated with that group who went to pick up the laptop from Mac Isaac's store on the 9th of December 2019. Remember, this is a long time ago. Uh, This is before the first impeachment. So the counterintelligence group had all of the laptop, which proves Russian uh, or proves Ukrainian malfeasance and everything that that whole impeachment was about and sent their number two guy to testify against the president. And he had to have known about it. And now we find out that that same agent that was sent to pick up the laptop was also the same agent who interviewed Gal Luft, the uh, Israeli Cypriot, who uh, they are trying to say was engaged in a trade with Iran that was uh, violated weapons laws. And he went to the FBI with information. This is a guy who you know went forward of his own accord and now they're trying to hunt him down. But it's interesting that the same FBI agent who picked up Hunter's laptop was the same guy who interviewed Gal Luft in Belgium and I believe also in Washington, DC. And it all goes back to this counterintelligence group at the FBI. And I've said many, many times, this is really not about the Bidens. This is about intelligence agencies that have gone completely rogue. The FBI counterintelligence unit is essentially a little brother of the CIA and NSA. It's become a leviathan since um, uh, 9-11. And and really, something has to be done to stop it. I mean, a perfect example, and I may have said it before, but the important things are worth repeating. There's a CIA case officer named Kofor Black who sat on the same uh, board of directors at Burisma, the Ukrainian gas company that Hunter sat on. Their signatures are side by side on dozens of documents for anybody inside the U.S. intelligence apparatus or the State Department to claim a lack of knowledge is impossible. Uh, Or they're so incompetent that the whole structures need to be literally uh, turned upside down. But uh, this is where we are. And so you had 40 guys on the payroll, I might add, of the FBI. Most of these confidential informants are paid with taxpayer money. And they're coming forward and they don't continue to get paid if they don't provide good information. So Apparently, the only information they provide that's not good information is stuff on the Bidens. 
And again, it was shut down by the Baltimore office, which is the counterintelligence unit, Peter Strzok, Bill Price staff. And these guys have a great tie, uh, another tie in with uh, Louis Free. Louis Free was director of the FBI. He, he's a consigliere to the Biden family. He's the one who Hunter hired to get his uh, Romanian criminal friend out of jail. Louis Free is the one who gave uh, the Biden grandchildren trust $100,000. Louis Free is a good Catholic, by the way. Uh, Louis Free is also very likely the one-eyed FBI agent who tipped Hunter's Chinese partners off to the fact that they were going to be arrested. Uh, Louis Free has coincidentally one eye. This is as corrupt as it could possibly get, and I'm told by two separate sources. One I can name, Bernard Carrick, former uh, uh, chief of police of New York City that uh, Louis Free and Peter Strzok are old besties dating back from the 90s when Peter Strzok was a, a junior officer in the counterintelligence unit. Uh, he said they were always together. This is through Flight 800 inf investigation, the first World Trade Center bombing, putting away the five families. And then this same thing was confirmed by another guy inside our uh, the IC community, the intelligence community, that what Carrick said was true, and even more so, that they were running illegal spy catcher teams back in the 90s, Louis Free, Peter Strzok, and that James Comey, surprise, surprise, was the uh, Chinese firewall or the executive officer who would take the fall for the uh, director if anything ever happened. And so the problems go very deep. They're not just the Bidens, and, and this is a perfect example of it. I mean, one has to ask yourself the question, is, are the Bidens the only people being protected by this racket? I very much doubt that. We also had from Congress this week, we had Representative Paul Gossar uh, talking about Biden's persecution of Christians at home, destroying his credibility abroad. Let's take a look at that clip. Sadly, this administration's persecution of Christians here at home strips him of any credibility whatsoever in fighting religious discrimination abroad. The Department of Justice under this administration has indicted at least 34 people of protesting outside abortion clinics under the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrance Acts. Many pro-lifers face years behind bars. One man, Mark Hoke, was arrested in front of his wife and seven children in an unnecessary and brutal raid where FBI agents brandished their weapons at the family. Multiple FBI field offices worked together to construct a memo that encouraged the infiltration and targeting of Catholic worshipers. The DOJ threatened states that, that passed laws protecting children from mutilation and harmful chemical infusions. Biden signed a law last year that perverted the federal definition of marriage. The U.S. military refused to grant thousands of brave service members a religious exemption to the COVID-19 vaccine. Health and Human Services seeking to limit the ability of employers to oppose to providing contraceptive coverage to religious, for religious reasons to refrain from violating their conscience. January 6th prisoners have claimed that federal prison officials have prevented them from attending religious services. Meanwhile, riot, rioters who destroyed property to the tune of $2 billion in the summer of love and pro-abortion terrorists who firebombed pro-life pregnancy centers roam free. This administration should start with itself when it comes to eradicating religious freedom. Now the question, Mr. Curry, does the persecution of Christians here at home by this administration undermine the ability of advocates to help prosecute Christians abroad? Uh, Congressman, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. I'm, my expertise is on international persecution. I would, Dr. Know. Patterson, do you mind saying the question one more? Time? Yeah. Does the persecution of Christians here at home by this administration undermine the ability of advocates to help persecute Christians abroad? I'd say that the persecution of people of faith at home does undermine our efforts abroad. Would you agree, Dr. Mobs? I would agree. Yes. As we know, there's um, worldwide persecution of Christians, um, primarily um, in Nigeria, but all around the world. Um, and um, we now, you know, the United States has often been the one with our religious freedom commissions, been the one calling out those countries that aren't protecting religious freedom and Christians. Um, the persecutions are being ramped up. Over 300 million Christians in the world are being subjected to brutal, brutal persecution. But here in the United States, 
shockingly, um, we see that the Biden administration is coming after Catholics, um, specifically the FBI. And Paul Gosar was, um, you know, very astutely reminding the Biden administration that we're not going to be able to call out to the rest of the world about the persecution of Christians when, in fact, there is a, you know, a rampage going on against against traditional Catholics, against Christians. We will continue to see and find out more and more about operations by the government going after um, peace-loving Christians and Catholics um, and posing them as domestic terrorists, which is you know absurd to the extreme. Um, but nevertheless, you know, the moral voice for how many generations America is now doing what has it has been criticizing other countries doing, persecuting peace-loving Christians. It's a, a real sad state of affairs. Only one thing I think uh, would be worse than that, Liz, and that would be if the if the church hierarchy was also complicit in that. And this is what concerns me very much, very much, because because I don't see them reacting strongly well, to the persecution of, if you will, traditional Catholics, Latin mass Catholics who are being targeted. I don't see any reaction. I don't see a reaction against the, the Catholics who are being targeted, sent to re-education camps in China. Those who refuse to, to go along with the with the Pope Francis's uh, new uh, ideals for religion in China, uh, I don't see any reaction, and and I'm I'm beginning to to fear that there's some cooperation or collaboration uh, between the hierarchy and the governments. It's always discouraging in in history. It's always a a, a red flag. Let me put it that way. When the church is in agreement with the government, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Somebody's somebody's not doing his job. That's all. That's all I can tell you. One side or the other is not, or both are not doing their job. And I and I find it I find it very suspicious. All of this happening without a word of criticism from the hierarchy. Nothing. Yeah. At the same time, Pope Francis is going after traditional Catholics. Um, we see the FBI going after same time, exact same time. My prayer is to Jack's point is that we have um, 40 whistleblowers in the Vatican step forward. I would like to see the same kind of courage coming from those in the inside of the Vatican um, as we do from those whistleblowers who are bravely stepping forward in the FBI. We have yet to see that except for Archbishop Vigano. One of the things, Liz, I just wanted to get to because the Ohio situation is so horrific but it brings up a, a neat opportunity to talk about something. So the arguments on which, you know, this is usually predicated are, you know, we want safety for women and we can't let them get back alley abortion. So we have to make it available. And so, you know, they're radical solutions for those, those states now that have protected life. They're like taking people across the border. We just had an incident in Oregon, I think, that exemplifies the horror of this situation. You want to give us details there? Sure. An Idaho mother and her son are being charged with kidnapping and taking the son's 15-year-old statutory rape victim out of state for an abortion in what is be, uh, what's being considered as a media test case for the um, state's abortion trafficking law. Um, the mother is being charged or and son are being charged with felony count. Uh, the, Son is being charged with felony counts of rape, second degree kidnapping, producing um, child sexually explicit material. The mother is also being charged with felony counts of second degree kidnapping, trafficking in methamphetamines, possessing controlled subst substances as particular um, fentanyl, and harboring a wanted felon. They were investigating um, the victim's mother said that her daughter had been uh, raped and then taken for this forced abortion without the parents permission and without the girl's permission. This son is facing up to life in prison for rape and up to 115 years um, for um, the other charges. The mother, you know, is being um, charged with up to 44 years 
Um, but there is a law on the books in Idaho um, establishing the crime of abortion trafficking. And it certainly seems to me that this particular set of circumstances falls within this abortion um, trafficking crime. And we're seeing, you know, with these wide variety of, you know, abortion trafficking laws on the books in certain states, and then these um, broad laws like what will happen in Ohio, um, constitutionally embedded laws, um, having abortion as a protected right. Um, we're going to see a lot of um, confusion. Um, and, you know, and this really does point out, point out that the left never rests. We got the Dobbs decision, didn't we, in the Supreme Court? And what happened? We They immediately pivoted to moving on embedding abortion as a constitutional law in all the various states. So we've got to up our game, pro-lifers. We've got to be, um, we've got to be ever vigilant that they're going to continue to push this agenda. And, um, you know, 14 states currently ban all or most abortions, but um, the left is going to continue to target these states like they did Ohio. We had a disastrous um, election with 56 percent of the people in Ohio voting to embed this uh, just draconian abortion law into the Constitution. And what what happened? Um, the pro aborts outspend pro lifes lifers by four, uh, twelve million dollars. Um, the constant bombardment of <clears throat> ads um, in Ohioans Ohioans were just not paying attention. One of the things that also happened this week, and I know it, it's, there's so much going on, and but there's a few things that we already touched on that I thought we should come back to because part of the uh, Nashville shooter. Um, the uh, identity and, and manifesto came out. Just part, not not the whole thing. But it's still at least somewhat interesting because remember this transgender shooter and people were threatened for even wanting to release the information. Give us details there if you could, Liz. The um, transgender sh shooter, you know, they kept this, this manifesto quiet. Now we know why they kept it quiet. You know, they do not want the world to understand and to see that mental illness is a part of transgenderism, that, that racism is a part of um, this particular really very troubled person. Um, the language, and there's just a section of this manifesto that was released. She was talking about having a high body count of children in the school. She was calling them white crackers. She was calling them individuals with white privilege. She was going, you know, this is what we call in law enforcement a police suicide. Police kill, you know, people who want to be suicide, police kill them. It's a police <clears throat> suicide. But, and I'm sure there's a lot more in this manifesto, um, but this, um, this slice of information tells you the anger, the violence, the vitriol, um, and I'm tracking a number of trans crimes happening around the United States. And keep in mind, and people have to keep in mind, much of this is being suppressed and censored by the media because they want to create this privileged class of individuals. And as if they're on the same plane as everybody else, they're extremely troubled. This is a mental illness. We're going to find out more about this, in what's in this manifesto. And we're going to see um, it, a violent, troubled person that many people knew of, knew um, that she was harboring these thoughts. Um, it's an absolute tragedy. And, you know, the impact of someone uttering the words about children that she wants a high body count. What kind of madness is that? Was this person on steroids? I mean, you know, what what drugs was was this person on um, to transition? In any event, the, there's got to be answers. 
The FBI has got to stop censoring these documents um, and this information. The public needs to know so that they can prepare and protect their children in their communities from uh, this kind of indiscriminate violence. On the abortion issue and the Supreme Court decision, I, I think we in the pro-life movement and Catholics particularly make an error in thinking that this was a moral decision. This was a constitutional decision, despite the fact that we have many Catholics on the bench. It was a pure, clean decision. So we have to expect that it's going to go back to the states and they're going to make their decision. And you have to remember that all these states, uh, Ohio is of interest to me, but places, uh, there were 26 or 27 states in which there were no laws concerning abortion in 1972, right? Pure decision between you and your doctor. Uh, so I agree with you, Liz, we have to be vigilant on the basic level, and it shows you that they passed this in an off election year. And we have to be more vigilant at the ballot boxes. When it comes to this uh, crazed individual, a couple of things that I took away from the three pages that we were able to see were, number one, she called all the students faggots, which is uh, a slur against, I would imagine, her community. And then, uh, or his community, whichever it, day it was. And the other thing, I thought was very interesting. If you could see on the one of the right hand side after uh, her page called Death Day, it looks like she created a cost structure for her little activity. And uh, that would be a curious page to see how much did she spend in preparation for this. And the last thing I want to say about her, he, they, them, was that they said uh, she, they almost got caught several times, particularly one time in the summer of 21, where they almost got nailed. So obviously, this person was up to crazy stuff for a year or more before they went out and committed this act right now in March of 23. So what I would really like to know is wh where were the parents? Where were the peers? Because I don't believe somebody with these strong attitudes and secondarily uh you know a hatred of the white race white privilege this person's talking about this and she also mentions one more thing i apologize going to a gun range on the way to the uh, school i think she was used as a prop so she could put her gear together at the gun range and then leave and go to the school but this crazy was at a gun range on a regular basis i mean didn't anybody see that this was not a well person? That's what I don't understand. We see this over and over. Again. The same thing, Liz, in your home state of Skokie, was that a transgender kid who shot up the parade? Remember, it's in a dress and that, ooh, shut that up. You know, we don't even get used to gun control arguments when it's that clear. Yeah, he was in a dress and just shot indiscriminately during the July 4th parade. Um, all sorts of signs. Um, but everybody is afraid to be called homophobic, be, uh, transphobic, and so nobody intervenes anymore. Remember the old days where moms would look out, you know, the front window to make sure the kids playing were okay and safe. Everybody watched out for everybody. Those days are over. You can't. We're all being censored. Um, we all need, you know, to be liked. Um, can't we can't be hateful. Um, those uh, those moments in our community where interventions save lives, whether it's a drug intervention, a, you know, mental illness intervention, they save lives. But you, you can't just cross your fingers. You got to take a step. I mean, it's like being a whistleblower, right? It's it's the same thing. The same thing happened in Maine last week. This guy was clearly having schizophrenic episodes. All his peers in the army before they removed him with cause said that they were afraid that he was going to do something like this. That he would talk crazy all the time. His ex-wife and his son were in fear of their lives for this guy. They talked to the police multiple times. I mean, if you're going to have red flag laws, right, can schizophrenics have guns? I mean, you know, how do we define the mental illness at this point? And this was a guy who the authorities had knowledge about as being somebody who was off his rocker.
And yet, you know, they're allowed access to these things. I, I'm not for control, but uh, there are usually leading indicators before these people take the leap off into the abyss. Father, what did your take? Because the Ohio decision is, I, I think, scary for America, scary for Ohio particularly, because of the whole notion their their blood cries out to God for vengeance, I think is is something quite real. God does punish those who turn from him in these wild ways. Um, just last week, we heard that President Macron is in France is going to do the same thing for France. He wants to enshrine a right to abortion in their constitution. We just passed in Europe as we were coming back. In the last few days, they had a massive um, aurora borealis seen all throughout Europe. Um, I actually caught one just yesterday in uh, Alberta, Canada as well. Is there some connection uh, to, you know, the things we do on earth, the signs in the heavens and and punishment from our Lord? Signs are signs. They're real signs. Oh, spring is a sign. A blossom on a tree is a sign. Anything is a sign. And I think when we have unusual lights coming at night, <laughs> yes, that's a sign. I would sit up and take note of that. As a matter of fact, I, I am. I'm doing a little bit of uh, private uh, research into uh, into Fatima and and uh, La Salette and to a, to a few other things. Uh, uh, just it's it's uh, uh, let me let me let me say this, and and I don't mean uh, I don't mean I mean no offense to anybody. I I personally am am uh, leery of, of 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 these things of, of prophecies and everything else. I, I, I like to stick with with uh, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Blessed Mother, and His Holy Church, and and that's that's it. I I think that what I'm doing, I feel like Saint Philip Neri. Remember when he was playing cards and and, and what with the, at, on a Sunday night with other with four other priests, and one during the card game said, uh, "What would you do if the, you knew the world was ending next week?" And they all gave different things. Well, I'd go. With, Reconcile with my brother. I haven't talked. We haven't talked in ten years. Well, I'd settled some, an affair about an, an, an inheritance, uh, an amount that that was it's been pending for twenty years and this other. And when it came to Saint Philip Neri, he said, "I'd continue playing cards. If you're okay, you're okay. If you're okay, you're okay." I feel sorry for a world that is not okay. That's 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 the problem. I feel I feel bad for the world, and I think in a, in, in to a to a great degree. We, as the Catholic Church, have failed the world because we've become more like it, and we haven't stood in in opposition to it and corrected it. Uh, we're going along with it. I have to I have to say one thing on the on uh, the, what are these what are those what are they called on on YouTube shorts? They have shorts, you know that are right. Well, some of them are are are, are really great, and I heard one the other day that that made me laugh out loud, and it was. On the abortion issue, you've got you've got a there was a young man, uh, full of zeal, uh, talking to a young woman, and he was on the on the side of life, she was on the side of abortion, and they were back and forth the same the, the, the classic arguments back and forth. But finally, she stopped and she said, "Well, that's just a clump of cells." And this young man looked right looked her square in the eye and said. You're a clump of cells. <laughs> she went back. She didn't know how to react. She was absolutely frozen. And I, I thought this was excellent. Yes, that's exactly it. Uh, when it hits home, it makes sense, right? But I thought if you if you haven't seen that, you really should. It's 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 fantastic. It, it, it makes the point. Uh, one other thing, as Jack was saying, and 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 also Liz brought up, I would love to know one one day before I die. What percentage of the United States, what percentage of Canada, what percentage of France is on drugs? I mean, mind-altering drugs. I would like to know the percentage of that. Uh, when, whenever they're arresting all of these, these, these people who are obviously mentally unstable, we, we understand that. Nobody, we get no reports about them being on drugs. I, I think that that should be included in, in, in every sort of report, in, in report, he was on this or she was on that. We've got a major problem with drug addiction, and we're looking everywhere else except at what's wrong with us as a people. Uh, mental illness is a problem. 
drug addiction, I think, is a bigger problem because I happen to know drug addicts who became mental patients. They were not mental patients before. And this is growing. I'd like to see that reported. I'd, I'd like to see somebody do, uh, the federal government, do a major uh, survey of, of this and give, give some stats on it. But anyway, that's, that's, that's my true sense. You know, Father, when you talk about Ohio and, and this incident, Ohio is a very broken state. It used to be the heartland. It used to be an industrial center in the heartland. Used to be very conservative. Ohio as a state, I think, had the highest uh, participation in Vietnam, uh, had the highest casualty rate of any state on a per capita basis. There are multiple counties in Ohio, rural counties, where more young people die every year of overdoses in those counties, talking four or five thousand people sometimes, then die in the entire Vietnam War from those counties with the highest death rate from the war. And so, you know, we have to realize that many of the things that we are suffering right now come down to a lack of law and order on almost every level. Certainly uh, the border is just the tip of the iceberg, but just watch what gets enforced and what doesn't get enforced. I mean, the FBI is more concerned with than they are with actually arresting Hunter's criminal partners. We see this over and over again. And I guess the big question is, qui bono? Because the American people are not benefiting. There must be a small, small subset that are. One of the things before we before we leave off, and I want to give you a chance, Liz, to, to go through some of the good news, because I know there is some good news. Um, I raised the issue of the lights uh, to to bring us back to the understanding what's going on in the Holy Land. War is always terrible, but a lot of these things have been prophesied. And the reason why I brought up the Aurora Borealis is because in Fatima, Sister Lucia said that our Lord told her there will be a great light um, which will indicate God's punishment will be about to come upon the world. And right before the advent of the Second World War, you had this massive aurora borealis. In fact, it was so startling that it made it into all of the newspapers. People thought, you know, the city was on fire. The the ships thought the city was on fire because that's why there was so much bright light in the middle of the night. This is an account from um, Professor Roberto Dumate, who was with us at Rome Life Forum. He's a very famous uh, Catholic historian uh, in Italy. But he was just writing in a publication called Voice of the Family. He wrote this about the Aurora Borealis. He wrote, On November 5th, an unexpected Aurora Borealis lit up the skies of Europe and of Italy, where it was seen from the Alps to Puglia. Astronomers have offered the scientific explanations of the optical phenomenon, but one who has a spiritual or supernatural spirit turns a thoughtful gaze to heaven and wonders if this event might not be connected with the Aurora Borealis of 1938 and 39, which, according to Sister Lucia of Fatima, announced the Second World War. An apocalyptic sign? An Aurora Borealis can also be a luminous sign of hope, inviting us to judge the things of earth with the eyes of heaven and reminding us that all the causes and all the effects of what happens in the world have their first principle and their ultimate end in God, the only one who can give peace on earth to men of goodwill who seek his glory. I thought that was a perfect way to intro uh, what's happening in the Holy Land. Um, Yes, it's horrible. But in the face of that horror, there are a couple of just amazing things that happen. Wherever, um, you know, there's there's hell on earth, the good stand to show, and their, their light does shine. Liz, if you could give us those details on what's going on in the Holy Land. As probably expected, Mother Teresa's sisters, um, who are do great work around the world um, in troubled war spots, are remaining in Gaza uh, to tend to the sick, the injured, Um, bringing food, supplies, um, despite the danger to them. This is the Christian witness. This is what the Catholic Church has done from the beginning of all time. And certainly in America, you know, the the nuns who build schools and orphanages and hospitals 
And the work of the Catholic Church is carrying on not as an NGO getting federal grants, but as a charitable organization like Mother Teresa's characters. That is what is the face of Christ, right? That's the face of Christ that Francis wants us to ignore. Um, those beautiful, beautiful sisters, um, those you know, beautiful priests that are suffering but carrying on their work. I mean, they're I mean, John Henry and I saw a lot of talked to a lot of priests who are, you know, being persecuted, who have, you know, one foot on a banana peel, who are nevertheless for their, you know, treasuring their vocation and carrying on in the light of just terrible persecution. This is the face, of course, that Francis wants us to ignore. We cannot do that. We have to lift up and and remind each other that despite whatever's happening in the Vatican, that the true Holy Spirit is working through um, the Mother Teresa nuns, the many, many hundreds, thousands of people that we met at the Rome Life Forum, those brave Africans who are who are saying, take your money, people of the West, we don't need it. Those brave a- Africans who said, you know, Pope Francis, because we embraced Catholicism, because when the missionaries came to Africa, what they were teaching us was absolutely our culture. Our culture was family first, the beauty of children, the beauty of you know offering up our lives for God. We that's why we embrace Catholicism. So, you know, despite all the darkness, um, the face of Christ is seen not only in the Mother Teresa nuns, but it also um, John Henry had originally talked about the Latin patriot Cardinal Pizzabello, who it reconsecrated the Holy Land to Our Lady Queen of Palestine. These are the things that the Catholic Church um, do, public witnesses to the beauty of our faith. Um, that God is working through all of us, that we are in the image and likeness of God. So um, some good news um, that I think is really important to rejoice about. And I want to leave you with one more piece of good news. Um, Remember when we were talking about the LGBT nonsense all over the place? Well, there was only one team uh, in Major League Ball, who didn't do that? We were at, if you remember, we went out to uh, the LA Dodgers stadium to protest there because they were doing their nonsense. And it was so horrible. Well, there was one team who uh, didn't uh, fall into that, and they were the Texas Rangers. Um, and of course, um, they just won the World Series. Let's take a look at that clip. And a lot of people have noticed that the only Major League Baseball team that did not have a Pride Night also became world champions. And I think it's pretty obvious that Jesus had a big hand in showing the world he rewards the people that listen to his guidance. So this is a special thanks to God and America for creating a sport that can bring us together during a tough time when World War III is right on the horizon. So let's celebrate the Rangers and not the Los Angeles Dodgers who host drag queens at their games because we learned a huge lesson for transgenders are only good at beating women in sports and not men. I think it's a beautiful thing to see people start declaring their faith and uh, things like LifeSite News are very important for that because many people are cowards. I think that's the biggest problem with Francis. He, he's a coward, right? He, he He's willing to yield to the mob then rather than do what he knows is the right thing. And, and we see this across the population. So when you begin to see professional athletes who are risking endorsements and everything else, talking about our, our blessed mother and Jesus Christ, that's a positive thing. That's courage in, in the uh, arena. And it gives courage to all the fans. So, amen. Just one one thing to add to what Liz was saying about the, the good sisters. Uh, before, uh, before they were convinced uh, of, of women's liberation and uh, social justice, those great women, those great women were the backbone of the Catholic Church. They, they weren't just, you know, some a, a sideshow going on uh, over here. They were the backbone. They built the Catholic Church. They really did. I'm, I'm amazed at listening to so many of them talking. They need to be priests. No, they don't need to be priests. No, not at all. 
those sisters who are remaining in Gaza right now, mothers, Mother Teresa's sisters, <laughs> are the strongest women in the world. They have a, they have a priesthood that, that, that is non-parallel. It's fantastic what they're doing. This is what we need more of. And I'll tell you something else. One of the secrets that the, that the sisters had, especially the, the traditional sisters, they could cause grown men to help them. All they had, a, a grown man would look at those, those uh, Protestant, J Jewish, Catholic, didn't matter. They would look at those women and see their dedication to whatever cause they had and jump in and help, right? This is what they could do, and they still can, and many of them are doing it. They're growing also. Look, I've I, I, I got a place here where, where priests come uh, for, uh, they come for retreats, and, 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 uh, and sometimes a little bit of, uh, they're a little bit burnt out. A little bit burnt out. A, a lot of them discouraged by what's happening presently in the church. I keep telling them, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. I see traditionalism growing. Just two weeks ago, I had a group of young priests here, all in cassocks, of course, petitioning to begin their own religious community. <laughs> this is fantastic. I, things are happening that we don't see, but they are happening. And the church is alive and well. And uh, I think after after this pontificate, God willing, uh, a lot of a lot of men and women are going to be able to come out and show themselves and uh, and and live openly what they what they profess and be Catholic again. And I think the church is going to be Catholic again too. There's a lot of there's a lot of. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Jack. And to all of you, so good to be with you again, back from Rome and everything else. Stay tuned next time. For Faith and Reason, and we'll see you then. Hi, everyone. This is John Henry Weston. We hope you enjoyed this program. To see more like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button below to get all the latest content from LifeSite News. Check the links in the description to read more and connect with us on social media so that you can stay up to date with all the latest life, family, faith, and freedom news. Thanks for watching, and may God bless you.